Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Common Sense. Today we have the privilege of meeting Patricia St. Aubin, who is running for a state auditor. Patricia, welcome aboard. Thank you, Tom. Welcome. It's, it's great to have you in Brockton, um, the city of champions. Right. Yep. We, um, we have uh, a championship uh, football team who you probably know over the years throughout the state uh, has a lot of or many championships probably the most state championships but we also have uh, a lot going on with our city and our uh, high school and the good things there but um, we're so pleased to have you thank you um, I was actually a champion here once you were yes swimming Oh, I saw that in your yeah. background. You are quite the swimmer. Yeah. We do have a nice pool over yes. at Brockton High. Yes, you do. Yeah, we, we were uh, very fortunate when that was that facility was built in the early 70s to actually have a planetarium, mm -hmm. which was unheard of yeah. at the time, yep. a, a on-site swimming pool at a high school level, which was pretty unique, and right. also a skating rink, which right. is right there. So it's quite the facility we have. I uh, made the states over there one year. So are you still a swimmer? I am. You do. How often do you swim? Um, almost every day in the morning. Oh, excellent. To get my day going. Oh, good. So, good for you. And I still compete, too. Oh, all right. Well, you're so, fit and trim. Well, I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's talk to people that may not know you in Brockton. Um, sure. You know, tell, tell us a little bit about your background and right. your family life. Yeah. Um, it's always good to start with some familiarity. And I actually was born in New Bedford, so not far. New Beige. New Beige, exactly. Yeah, yeah. my wife's family was from New Beige. Oh, yeah. interesting. Is, what is she, French? French Canadian. Yeah, yeah French Canadian. Uh, me too, although I'm three quarters Irish, so there was a big Irish contingency La there Chapelle too. was the last name. Okay. La Chapelle from New Bedford. La Chapelle. So um, I was born there in New Bedford and lived in South Dartmouth and grew up in South Dartmouth, mm -hmm. close by next door. My dad was an entrepreneur. He had a uh, commercial painting contracting company, but he also rose in the New Bedford community, become one of the pillars of that community, and volunteered his time with the Chamber of Commerce and the United Way and the Rotarians and Junior Achievement, and you name it, he got very involved. So very civic-minded. A lot of public service. A lot yeah. of public service. My mother as well, she has been, she's 90 and she's still alive, and she's been a town meeting member, no longer, but up until a couple of years ago she her. was wow. yeah and um, so and they were very politically active and my mother did a lot of volunteer work at st. Luke's which is the hospital sure, down yeah, there Luke's, yeah. and at the library and then she was over at the Roach Jones Duff Museum one of the whaling um, buildings I hate to tell you this but last um, Friday the whalers were in town Oh. And they didn't fare too well against the Brockton Boxer oh. football team, oh. but they were—they were good. It was—it was a good group. Okay. It was a good night. It was a fun evening. Good. Well, I actually went to Bishop Stang, and I believe we played Brockton as well. So um, I went to the regional Catholic high school, mm -hmm. and then I did go on from there to Providence College, um, right out of high school, and I studied accounting. And that would come in handy for what you're running for. I hope it? so, <laughs> and I hope the taxpayers agree. And so I did get a Bachelor's of Science from Providence College in Accounting. It was four years of rigorous study. I was one of 20 women getting that degree the year I graduated out of a class of about 90 folks so, that were so studying. So back then, the, you know, it was a minority of, uh, of, of women that were in that field. Exactly. So I got out of college and went up and canvassed my resume in the financial district and I was hired by the former Shawmut Bank, which I think now has morphed into the Bank of America, and I was hired in what was then uh, called the Asset-Based Lending Group of Commercial Lending, and that was companies that were putting up their accounts receivable or their inventory as collateral, and the auditor's role was very important to go out on a regular basis and make sure that what they were collateralizing, what they were putting up, in fact existed. Right, was real. It was real. In case of default Fraud. yeah right yeah and uh, the asset based lending group was kind of the rough and ready um, aspect of the bank it was one step before loan workout so oftentimes these companies had problems financially um, some of them were cyclical where they might have a product that they strictly sold for the Christmas market and that's why they'd put up their accounts receivable because they'd need the money in mm -hmm. advance sure. and the orders were sure. coming in but they didn't have the cash yet and so it as they say it was a great way to learn auditing. It was a great way to learn the four years of accounting that I had studied because we were out looking at 
all the books and putting together all the pieces, the financial piece of what these organizations were in fact representing and what should be reported back to the bank. I, I see in your background that you, you really do have a nice uh, wide range because you, you did work for banks, you worked for the insurance company, insurance obviously industry. everyone knows John Hancock, right. I see that. Um, Beth Israel Deaconess, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. so, you know, hospitals, I mean, so you really have touched upon, you know, the major large areas of this state in terms of, you know, business and what they're involved in, right? Exactly. Um, I also have a master's in American history as well. So you're well-rounded. I'm well-rounded and, um, you know, the auditing thing can be uh, investigatory uh, as a trade, but then when you study history and get a master's in history, um, you're looking for primary source documents and you're ferreting through information. So mm -hmm. it's also another tool of, you know, knowing how to go and, and have the thread of information follow. Um, for those at home that might not know, why don't you tell us what the role of the state auditor is so that they, the voters can, you know, make an informed decision about, you know, the position and, you know, who would be right for the position and I'm sure they'll agree that uh, you're the right candidate. Well, I'm hoping so. The Boston Globe just did because they endorsed me on Saturday for this position just to let which, everyone know. Which, which is really incredible because you know, they're not endorsing, you know, a new incumbent in, no. that, in that position. So that tells you something that there's obviously uh, a, an assessment that uh, has been done by the Globe that they just don't feel that this is the right person and that you certainly would be more suited for the role. Yes, it was a feather in my cap, as yeah. they say. Yeah. But to talk about the State Auditor's Office, um, the State Auditor's Office actually has um, review of about 375 state agencies that fall under a few different categories. Um, some of the education audits are done in charter schools. There are uh, financial management audits, which recently they looked at the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, Health and Human Services, which is the Department of Child and Family, that kind of audit. Housing authorities, which is probably a few. We'll housing talk about that. Okay. We'll talk about housing authorities. We yeah. can. And <laughs> then there's independent authority audits, which would include Massport, information technology or IT audits, um, judicial law, or sheriff's offices, and the court systems fall under another uh, series of audits. And then transportation audits. So they are to go in and do reviews of those agencies and make sure that the appropriated funds, which is a code for taxpayers' dollars, right. it's another term for it. Our money. Our money, exactly, is being spent wisely and efficiently. Mm. And, uh, and look for, for stated purposes. Right, and look mm. for waste and fraud. Um, the actual state itself um, has a comptroller um, that, you know, the whole review of the state actually is done by an outside firm. So they, but, but that occurred under the, in the 1940s or 50s when the state grew too large for the auditor's office to have everything under its purview. So it's um, got 375 state agencies that should be reviewed. And how regularly. many? Uh, and how large is the office, and uh, with respect to personnel as well as the budget? Well, I was uh, working off figures from 2012, which I thought there were 98 people that had an um, auditing or accounting background at the state auditor's office, and a total staff of 138. That was the last piece of information I was able to track. But I have found out through this process of running against the current state auditor that. I was told recently there are actually 230 employees um, and 115 of them audit. And I have a chart if we want to look at the results of what goes on in the auditor's office, if you want to see that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. so, so you would think from those numbers that um, there would be um, an increase in productivity, right? One would hope. Exactly. You would hope, yeah. And just to back up for a moment, um, when the current state auditor came into office in 2011, uh, there was a law on the books, Mass General Laws, that governs this particular agency. And it's Chapter 11, Section 12, that actually pertains to the auditor's office. And at that time, these 375 agencies, it was indicated in that um, law that they should be audited once every two years which equates to 187.5 audits that the auditor's office should be doing on an annual basis, and that is calendar year. And so when she came into office and she realized this, she didn't feel that she had the ability 
to audit at that level. So within about three or four months, she went to the state legislature, and she's come from the state legislature. She was a state legislator for herself for eight years. And so let me just stop you right there. Yeah. So you have a background in auditing and accounting, mm -hmm. but what you're saying is the current person in the role does has, not, has right. zero. She has zero. an English degree and a law degree. She's not an uneducated person, um, but it's not necessarily the proper skill set to know how to audit properly and thoroughly or to understand what your staff is doing on a regular basis. Which so would be helpful. It would be helpful. And again, I hope the taxpayers are paying attention <laughs> as they listen. Um, nonetheless, this particular law, the same law, was um, reviewed by the budgetary process at the state legislature for 2012, and the law was changed. And so now, the state, now that law reads that the 375 state agencies are reviewed every three years. And so that equates to 125 audits a year rather than 187. So your opponent points. lobbied for that change. She did. So basically went in, reviewed, and said, I, I can't keep up and do what was previously being done. Right. And so here are the results. I'm um, not sure what camera to put, put this in front of, um, but I think right that here. one? Okay, the one with the red light. Good. <laughs> Um, so here are the results. This is the precipitous decline of what's going on. Um, the first year when 125 hour audits became the benchmark, she actually did do 133 audits. But there's a disclaimer involved there in that Joe DiNucci, the prior auditor, had some of those audits already work in process, to use an accounting term. And she does state that in her opening letter, that this was begun under my predecessor, and we finished it up under my time frame. Of course, they were already in process. But the second year in office, there were 89 audits. Last year, there were 64 audits. And as of September 1st of this year, 2014, there's only been 32 audits um, out of that agency. Now she does get credit for four more through the month of September. Um, so as of October 1st, we're at 36 audits. And um, this uh, is supposed yeah. to be up at 125. And we've not leveled off. We've not had a break even point. We keep declining. Do and this is worrisome. Do you have any sense of what's happening? Or, you know, can you just hypothesize on what you think is going on? Uh, she claims that the audits are getting better. I don't actually see that when I review the audits. You know, if you take the Housing Authority audits, for example, some of them are two and three pages in length. And um, I've been doing a number of these shows for the last six months on my campaign. And for example, when I went to Franklin, which is, I actually live in Norfolk now, um, the next town over, they told me that the state auditors were there for three or four weeks. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I went home, the audits are online. I looked at that particular audit and it was only three or four pages in length. So there seems to be- It doesn't equate. It doesn't equate. And I've actually, you know, one of the things that I had been saying about these audits is that when I look at them, they review one or two items, and it may not always be the same one or two items. And I'd like to systemize that. I'd like to get in there, and if there's 13 items to be reviewed out of all the housing authorities, then they all should be audited similarly. And all 13 items, regardless of which housing authority we're at, should be reviewed. Right. Um, we all know what happened with the Chelsea Housing Authority, which all blew wide open during the last election cycle four years ago. It did not under, um, happen under the watch of the present state auditor, but the audit was completed under her watch, and she signed off all was okay. But an audit, that also shows a red flag. It's a picture of time. An audit is a picture of time that should keep taking the picture, you know, of what's going on in an agency. So that particular audit threw up a red flag about the executive director yeah, I mean, they embezzling were, money. Yeah, and the compensation was... 200000 more yeah, than what, than is, what is his salary was. Right. I mean, how did that happen, as they say? Um, well, you know, that goes back before her time. Um, but after reading the report and the investigations that the Globe actually did on that, it seems as if the auditors got way too friendly 
with Mike McLaughlin. And again, that's auditing 101. You change up auditors. You don't send in the same auditor to the same establishment so that you aren't going out to lunch yeah, with so the what, people what you're be, auditing. What would be some of the safeguards that you think are appropriate and you, under your watch, would implement? Right. Well, when I th think about when I audited professionally, and I audited anything from a mom and pop size company up to a nationally recognized firm that if I said their name, you'd say, oh, I'm familiar with mm -hmm. them. We did the same audit. The numbers changed. Right. And, you know, some were making hundreds of thousands of dollars and some were making multi-millions of dollars. But the information that we were gathering at those companies were identical. It's just that the situation was different based upon the size of the company. So this is what I don't see is the systems in place that audits should all be looking for the same information from similar agencies. And I actually had to do a forum with um, the current state auditor so would in you Worcester. suspect that there might be different rules for different people? I mean, is, would you be... You know, there's, there's a lot of suspicion here. You know, I, I just, I can't put my finger on it. One of the things, I mean, auditing is a little boring to most people and they don't always understand it. It's not particularly sexy. But when you're an auditor, one of the things that's most important to you are the work papers. When you go out to an establishment or an agency and you take down the data, you fill that all in on what's called working papers. That I don't have access to. I have access to the end result or the audit. Those are all online. And but uh, under my administration, I am, I've t said before, I've said before my competitor that I would work to get the working pages posted online as well. Because right now, I can understand why when I'm told that the auditors are present for three or four weeks, and then I go and look at the audit and it's only three or four pages in length, there's got to be something in those working pages that aren't transferring forward into the actual right. audit. Right. And that's all you and I, as public citizens, have access to. There is some transparency there, certainly, to see the end result, but not full transparency. Right. So yeah. I can't put the full picture together as a professional who's done this job because the guts of the audit is the working pages. Yeah, and so you'd make an effort to put the guts of the audit, to have more transparency, to right. have you know, someone like yourself, someone educated and, and knowledgeable in that field, to be able to actually see and interpret the final report. In order to interpret the final report, like you said, you need the background. You need the you backup. Wow. It's, it's all sitting there. So I don't know. Well, you there know, can't if be a lot of something. backup because there's only been 32 audits. <laughs> well, there could be a lot of working pages, but perhaps the information is not being transferred into the report. I mean, that's where I have question marks about what is still sitting in those working pages that don't appear in the report. And if you had access to those working papers, um, would you obviously be able to have a better gr uh, grip on why there are only X number of reports? Like you could basically take an assessment and say, you know, why are they wasting time on this or why is this being oh, well, done? I think I could understand, you know, if they were doing the audit similarly or not. If I could see everything, I think, yes, um, for anybody, I'm probably the only person out there that's auditing the auditor right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for the last ten and a half months, that's been my job to run in this position and to try to seek out information. And I can't get it all. I mean, it's just not there. So I'm piecing things together. But just to back up about the housing authorities, I have been saying along the campaign trail about if there are 13 or 14 items that should be reviewed, they should all be reviewed similarly. And I take a look at the Worcester Housing Authority audit that was done under Danucci's time frame in 2009, and it'll be six years in January since that housing authority will have been audited. So that's, tr that's th troubling. That's very troubling. But he did audit and look at 13 line items. And what he also said, and again, I've said this on the stump speech, was when the last audit took place and what the, that last previous audit had shown as perhaps problems and whether or not the problems had been corrected. And I don't see that in the audits as well. Again, when I talk about that picture of time, you take the picture, then you go away. 
Then you come back and you take another picture, but it should start off where the last picture left off. And if there's four or five years before we go back, then the picture's not going to be clear. And what you're saying, obviously, if would probably be a shared opinion amongst other professionals in your in, oh, in your most area. Definitely. They, they, they must all agree that. Oh yes, most definitely. I have concurred with classmates. I did not sit for my CPA because I went on to do something different with my career. I didn't stay as an auditor. One progresses in life, and I didn't stay at the bank. I didn't really want to stay in banking, and I didn't want to go to a public accounting firm. So I took that Bachelor's of Accounting, and I went entrepreneurial. But I have concurred with many of my classmates, because when you study accounting for four years, it's a group of people that gets very close with one another. Mm -hmm. And I have also researched you know, um, the, what's called the Yellow Book on governmental standard accounting procedures and auditing procedures. And it's the Comptroller General that puts out this particular book called the Yellow Pages. And you know, um, what I'm saying is how it's done, how it's professionally done. Can you comment a little bit upon the designation given to the auditor's office with respect to you know Massachusetts and the National State Auditors Association? Sure. The National State Auditors Association was called in uh, by the present state auditor when she took office. And basically, from my standpoint, it gave her the template on how to run an office and how to understand auditing. That's what they did for her. Um, they actually contract with 48 states out of the 50 and each state that contracts with them pays $3,500 to have a peer review done. And so she wanted to see what uh, Joe DiNucci was doing with the office, and she found that there were certain standards uh, based upon governmental auditing that weren't being done. And so at that time, she actually failed uh, when she came in, but they told her that she needed to elevate professionally uh, who she was hiring. And she's done that, apparently. Again, that's another question. Why are the audits precipitously declining when supposedly she's professionalized the office and made the threshold of at least a bachelor's degree? And added Be more staff. And added more staff, exactly. Because at the time that Joe was there, I guess some people had high school diplomas and associate's degrees. Nothing wrong with that, but just is that who you want auditing? So she did remove about 27 people brought more people in, elevated up the threshold of the professionalism. And so the second year, this past year, second time she's been audited by this National States Auditors Association, she did get what she likes to call the highest grade. But the highest grade, Tom, is a pass. So you either fail or you either pass. And so again, uh, being someone that likes to investigate things, I picked up the phone and I called down to Kentucky and spoke to the National States Auditors Association and queried them about how a state gets a pass, how many of them get the pass, and how she got the fail the first time. And apparently what I was told, and again, keep in mind that $3,500 has transferred to this agency twice now, that they had never contracted with them. They're an organization that started in 1989, and Joe Nanucci had been there for 24 years, and he had never thought that this was something important to do. So he never contracted with them. When she called them in, it was the first time they had looked at the state, and they've been in operation since 1989, and how it was described to me, we had to fail her because they weren't meeting any of our standards. That's why we needed to come in and give her the template. So this past year, she got a pass which she likes to say is the highest grade. But I asked the question, how many other states that contract with you, Hawaii and South Carolina are the two states that don't, how many get the pass? And I was told pretty much all of them do, that that's the whole point, mm -hmm. that they want to elevate the states to get to the pass level, that some get the pass with a couple of um, demerits, shall we say, that they're mm -hmm. doing a couple of things wrong. But the gentleman that I spoke to said, we don't want to fail a state. We actually want to. So it's all awfully hard to fail, is what exactly. you're telling me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and so that's where we're at with that, that it's basically a plaque on the wall. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that she has elevated, you know, to their standards and good for her. But she hasn't elevated for the taxpayer the number of audits. And that should be concerning right. to the voters. Right. And let's talk a little bit about the operation of that office and what's been going on. Yes. Um, things apparently haven't been smooth because there's, there's 
I'll call it upheaval. Why don't you describe the upheaval for the um, absolutely? There was at a home. dust up. <laughs> oh, there uh -huh. you go. Um, yes, her former campaign manager, who thinly got her across the line in uh, 2010 for this position, and her former top deputy, um, Laura Marlin, has her in a civil lawsuit right now, and there are allegations. I so was there. When you say her in a civil lawsuit, that means us in a civil lawsuit, correct? They're going to be suing her in addition to. Uh, no. Um, funny thing is, uh, the way I've read the court document, uh, because Suzanne uh, is in this uh, lawsuit, Laura Marlin actually used to work in the Attorney General's office. She was an assistant Attorney General. When the auditor normally finds themselves in a civil lawsuit, they do have access to the Attorney General's office for an attorney and we'll but I, I guess what I'm saying is taxpayer resources are now going to be involved in this in well, some probably, way, shape, or form. Yes. Um, I thought you meant who was paying for the attorney and because this woman used to work for the Attorney General's office before coming over to help with the auditor's mm -hmm. office, um, Suzanne cannot go back and access an attorney because of conflict of inf interest so she's had to go outside for her own attorney okay. and pay for her to herself. But nonetheless, the allegations are um, that number one, the State House was used to um, disseminate papers, denomination sheets that we all have to get to get on the ballot. We have to get signatures to get our name on the ballot. But from a professional standpoint, as an auditor, there's an element of this civil lawsuit, again, allegations, that are more troubling to me than even that. Um, and that is that one of the audits, and it's probably the Department of Child and Family audit that came out March 26th of this year, they have union employees, SEIU employees. And apparently there was the dust up between Laura and Suzanne about whether or not the union should have been able to weigh in on the audit when it was being performed. And I've heard Suzanne say it in front of me, she said it to the Globe, that she does in fact feel that the unions should be able to weigh in on an audit. And professionally, I highly disagree with that commentary. And that is, I guess, what the allegations are, that Laura Marlin produced um, from the Yellow Book what she felt was a conflict of interest, some verbiage about the fact that you cannot have a union weigh in. Professionally, how I've learned this job, and auditing is auditing, whether you're in the private sector or the governmental sector. In the private sector, you're working for the shareholders and the company owners. In the governmental sector, you're working for the public interest, which is you and I. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, an audit should not be compromised, no matter where it's being generated from. Right. And so, I looked it up, and it's, I don't know what Laura came in and talked about in her memo to Suzanne about the unions not being able to weigh in, but it's the independence of that particular audit, and it's Chapter 3 of the General Standards, and there's possibly a bias threat when you have an outside entity weigh Incredible. in. Incredible. Even a CEO of a company right. when you're outside in the private. So that It calls the, into question the integrity. That's it. So. it um, the threat that an auditor, as a result of political, ideological, or social convictions, has to take a different objective. Mm. And the other is undue influence sure. threat. The sure. threat that inst external influences or, pressure or presses will impact the auditor's ability to make an independent judgment. That is, I'm not sure what Laura walked in with mm -hmm. for her argument, but she was fired over um, producing some sort of memo Very that she troubling. said the union yeah, should not weigh troubling. in. And I don't feel anybody, when the audit's going on, the documents, the contracts, whatever you're reviewing, the paperwork tells the story, and you put your audit together, if you need to have somebody comment, it's after the fact. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to believe this, but we're coming up to our end. So is there, okay. is there a final message you'd like to talk to the voters about or ask them? Sure. Well, I do want their vote on November 4th and it's Patricia St. Aubin. You see it spelled here. I don't abbreviate the saint. I do have that professional degree in accounting and I've audited professionally. I was just endorsed by the Boston Globe on Saturday and I'm very proud of that and I made a very good presentation to them about my ability to go in and do a better job for the taxpayer and that's the bottom line here that I do think that these audits that have precipitously dropped that we're down to 36 audits mm -hmm. for October 1st, that the trajectory needs to go in a different direction. Well, I think that you will do that job, and 
We all wish you luck, and I'm just so glad that you came in. Well, thank, thank you for you the so time, much. Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.